Hi everyone, I'm Jacob Lackner, and it's Thursday, and that means it's time for another history video. To determine the topic of today's video, I posted a poll on my community tab asking what viewers would like to see, and people mostly wanted to see a video on the 10 most important medieval inventions. I have changed that topic slightly to instead talk about 10 medieval European inventions we still use today. The Middle Ages are often thought of as a backward time where there was no progress at all. A stagnant period where nothing new was invented, but this simply isn't true. There were many inventions and innovations in the Middle Ages that had long-term impacts, and in this video we'll talk about my picks for the 10 most important ones that we still make use of today. There are a few things I intentionally excluded from this video, including gunpowder, the dry compass, and other navigational technologies, as well as the printing press. While those are all invented at the tail end of the Middle Ages, they are also inventions that play a major role in bringing about the end of the medieval period, so they sort of straddle both medieval and early modern Europe. For this video, I wanted to avoid those types of inventions and instead stick with things that are purely medieval and not inventions that brought an end to the time period entirely. I'm also focusing primarily on medieval Europe in my selections. All right, let's get to the list. At number 10, I have something that I'm using right now. Eyeglasses. People often mistakenly believe that Benjamin Franklin invented glasses, but they're much older than that. He did invent the bifocal lens, though, which made them a little more useful, but more on that later. So, back to medieval glasses. The first time a medieval person speculated that lenses could be used to help improve someone's vision was 1268, when medieval scientist and Franciscan monk Roger Bacon wrote about them. It is possible that he actually invented glasses himself, but we don't know for certain. We do know that in 1306, a Dominican monk named Giordano de Pisa mentions eyeglasses in one of his sermons, specifically noting that it had been a few decades since they were invented. These early eyeglasses were only useful for far-sighted people, and it wouldn't really be until Benjamin Franklin's invention of the bifocal lens that they became useful for nearsighted people, too. Still, glasses are used by about a billion people on this planet, and we have medieval Europe to thank for them. And number nine, I have mechanical cranes. While cranes were utilized by the Romans, they were reintroduced to medieval Europe in the 13th century. During this time, the Gothic style was exploding, and in order to build these massive stone sculptures, a machine was needed that could assist in building. This led to the invention of the treadwheel crane, not too different from the ones utilized by the Romans. To use this machine, one person had to rotate the wheel, and this could allow the lowering and hoisting of heavy things. While medieval Europeans weren't the first to utilize that type of crane, there's another kind of crane that was brand new in the Middle Ages, and that was the harbor crane. These were also treadwheel cranes, usually they had two treadwheels, but they were built so they could pivot. This enabled them to help unload ships, which was crucial in an increasingly vibrant economic environment like 13th century Europe. Obviously enough, the descendants of these cranes are still crucial when it comes to building large structures and unloading cargo today. At number eight, I have Comenda contracts. So, while many of the things on this list are technological, some of the things I've included on the list are also ideas more than they are technological innovations, and Comenda contracts are one of those. Comenda contracts emerged in 10th century Italy, and they represent a major economic development, the birth of limited partnerships. These contracts were typically drawn up between two business partners, with one merchant and one investor. Basically, the merchant would take up the risk of doing the long-distance traveling, while the investor would help pay for some portion of the costs of the trip. Then, once the trip was complete, they would divide the spoils based on the terms of the contract. Over time, these contracts became increasingly complex, with multiple investors and merchant fleets involved by the 11th and 12th centuries. This was a big deal and a crucial step in the path towards merchant capitalism in medieval society. This allowed for entrepreneurship in medieval Italy. Limited contracts eventually developed into joint stock companies in the early modern period, and obviously enough, the idea of stocks, entrepreneurs, and investors is all still around today, and this is where it started. At number seven, I have the cog, which was a type of ship developed in the 12th century. Before the 12th century, sea travel was very challenging, as ship technology was not particularly reliable for most groups of people, though as I discussed in another video, Vikings were something of an exception to this. Anyhow, before the 12th century, ships couldn't be too big because they all used starboard-mounted steering oars, and if the ship got too heavy, these oars just couldn't exert enough force to effectively steer the ship. This made it quite difficult to ever move large amounts of any kind of goods by sea. These ships were also quite unstable overall. However, by the 12th century, a number of innovations were introduced with this new ship called a cog. First, they were clinker built. This is something that was almost certainly inspired by the Vikings, who used this same model of overlapping planks, 
which made for a more watertight construction. However, even Viking ships used steering oars, limiting how large they could be, so something else was needed for a real cargo ship as we think of them today. This was achieved by moving away from a steering oar to a rudder that was mounted on the stern. This allowed for much easier steering of the ship, and these two innovations combined to allow for the construction of cogs, which were massive, seaworthy cargo ships. Obviously enough, the use of a rear-mounted rudder is still utilized in many ships today. And number six, I have mechanical clocks. Timekeeping devices have a long history, with sundials being a thing throughout antiquity. The mechanical water clock was invented by the famous ancient Greek inventor Archimedes in the 3rd century BCE. This was the first clock to utilize gears, and the system was regulated by weights connected to these gears floating in a basin of water that was gradually filled and refilled to keep the gears spinning. It would be in the Middle Ages, though, that the first purely mechanical clock, the kind of clock we still use today, would be invented. These clocks used what is called a verge escapement to operate, and this is what creates the ticking of clocks that we're so used to today. Basically, this allowed clocks to be entirely self-contained, as energy was now transferred between mechanisms within the timepiece to keep it ticking. This allowed clocks to be much easier to operate, much smaller, even portable, and made it easier to put them pretty much anywhere you wanted to because you no longer needed water to operate them. There is some debate as to when exactly the fully mechanical clock was invented, with some saying it's as early as 1176 and others saying as late as 1322, but either way, it's a medieval innovation. At number five, I have two related inventions, horseshoes and the horse collar. Right around 1000, a major leap was made in terms of European agricultural production as a result of what is called by some the medieval agricultural revolution. During this time, agricultural surpluses began to be created for the first time since the Roman period. This was the result of many things, including new agricultural techniques, but there was also a technological element. The period featured a move towards horses as the primary draft animals. Before this, oxen were used as draft animals, and they were much more expensive to take care of, and not nearly as fast and efficient as horses. But before 1000, horses just couldn't be used as draft animals with the technology available in Europe. This was true for two different reasons. First, they had relatively fragile hooves, and working a lot could cause them to break, at which point the animal could no longer work effectively. This was remedied by the invention of the nailed horseshoe, which we have the first mention of around 960 CE. These were pieces of metal that were nailed to a horse's hoof to reinforce it, strengthening them. That only solved one problem, though. The other was that horse anatomy didn't seem particularly well suited to pulling a plow. Because of their long necks and windpipes, if you tried to put a yoke on a horse, it would simply crush their windpipe if they tried to pull. The horse collar was the remedy for this, as it would redistribute the weight of whatever they were pulling onto their shoulders. Now, the horse collar, unlike most things on this list, isn't an invention that originated in Europe. It came from China, but the horseshoe was a uniquely European innovation, and obviously enough, we use both of these things to this day. At number four, I have musical notation. In other words, a method of recording what music sounds like so others can reproduce it. In other words, basically the way we're seeing music written today. The origin of that system date back to the Middle Ages. I mentioned it in passing in an earlier video on this channel when I was talking about Christian converts to Judaism. In particular, I noted that a convert known as Obadiah the proselyte brought the Christian system of musical notation into Jewish circles when he converted, and that's the same notational system that I'm talking about here. Guido of Arezzo is considered to be the originator of the musical staff, and he wrote about his system in 1026. His musical staff is pretty much the same as the one we use today, with horizontal lines and spaces meant to represent different pitches. He even used the terms ut, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti for each of those notes. He used a specific hymn to describe his method of notation, and those are just the first two letters of words that have those notes in the hymn. Obviously, ut became do over time, but that's not a whole lot of change in almost a thousand years. Now, medieval notation didn't include quite as much information as modern musical notation does. Timing isn't quite as clear, with the change in pitch being the main thing it communicates, but over time, things like one-eighth and one-sixteenth notes and the like were added, all in the foundation of musical notation, invented by Guido of Arezzo. At number three, I have windmills, in particular the post-windmill, which we first have a record of in 1185. A post-windmill is basically the kind you're used to seeing, where there are several arms or sails attached to a circular wheel on top of a tower. Earlier windmills had vertical axles and weren't quite as efficient, whereas post-windmills were very efficient at harnessing the power of the wind for various tasks. Chief among these at the time was processing grains into flour. 
Post windmills are, of course, still used today to harness the power of wind to the point that wind actually produces about 10% of the energy we use in the United States. And number two, I have universities. It probably doesn't surprise you a whole lot that this is so high up for me, given that I've either been a student or faculty at a university since I was 17 years old, but yeah, universities were born in medieval European cities. After the agricultural revolution I mentioned earlier and the subsequent surplus of crops, fewer and fewer people had to live agrarian lives and people began moving to cities. This led to more of a specialization of labor, which in turn led to society becoming more complex, with more than just the nobility now capable of pursuing education. These cities all had cathedral schools, but these were ill-equipped to deal with increased demand, and over time these schools transformed into the first universities. At first, the system of education was kind of informal. People would flock to a city to learn from a certain individual or individuals, and people would get together and pay someone to teach them about something. The parts of town where these groups congregated came to be called Latin quarters because these educated people spoke Latin. Eventually, what we think of as campuses were built as things became increasingly complex. These universities borrowed their structure from the craft guilds being born around the same time, where everyone who was a member of one of these universities worked under the same universal terms, just as those wishing to learn a certain craft, like leather tanning did. Generally, just like a craftsperson would work under a master of leather tanning, for example, students worked under someone who was a master in a particular field. This is where we get the still-in-use term master's degree today. Students were, in a sense, apprentices to these masters who taught various subjects such as theology, medicine, mathematics, or law. Eventually, if you were educated enough, you got the title of doctor, which in Latin just literally means teacher. Also, if you've ever wondered why we wear such strange clothes when we graduate from high schools or universities today, this is why. We still pretty much wear the same clothing they did. And at number one, I have banking. In particular, long distance banking. We are all very used to how banks work today, but when you think about it, it's kind of weird. You can go pretty much anywhere in the world and use your debit card to withdraw money from an ATM, the money that's in that machine isn't even from your original bank. So we have quite an impressive infrastructure for all these different banks to be communicating with one another. This kind of long distance banking was really born in the Middle Ages as a result of the activities of the Knights Templar. Now, banking in some sense existed before all of this in a variety of ways, with medieval Jews often acting as moneylenders, and there were also banks in Italy, especially Lombard Italy, that lent money throughout Europe. However, lending money is only one aspect of what banks, as we think of them today, do. Another key function of banks is that you can deposit your money at them and then withdraw those funds when you want to. And this is something that was only fully put into practice with the Knights Templar. The Templars were a knightly order, born in Jerusalem between the First and Second Crusades. These were people who took monastic oaths but were also warriors. In fact, they were the most elite warriors among the Crusaders. They saw their main duty as protecting pilgrims to Jerusalem, and this is what eventually led them to create long-distance banking. If you were a medieval person, one of the big problems for going on a trip was that you had to make sure you had all the funds you would need for your entire trip. Without a bank or something like it, you couldn't get to your destination and then just withdraw money, like we do today. This made pilgrims very tempting targets for bandits, who knew they had massive amounts of money on them. Well, the Templars had set up a network of houses throughout Europe and the Holy Land, and the purpose of these places was to provide rest stops for pilgrims. But, at some point, they realized they could provide something else. The ability to deposit money at one Templar house, and then withdraw it at another one. So, say you're a Parisian and you want to go on a trip to the Holy Land, but don't want to bring all of your money with you. If that's the case, you would go to the Templar house in Paris, deposit your money, and get a receipt from the Templars there. Once you got to Jerusalem, or wherever you were in between that you needed money, you could present this receipt at a Templar house, and they would simply give you the money that you deposited elsewhere. In short, the wide reach of the Templars as an organization allowed people access to modern banking, and the fact that we can do the same thing when we go on trips today is a result of this important innovation. Getting involved in banking would ultimately not be so great for the Templars. They were wiped out in the early 14th century by a French king who was in debt to them, but other organizations and families would adopt a similar system, with Italy really becoming the heartland of banking for most of the rest of the Middle Ages. Well, those are my picks for the 10 medieval inventions that we still use to this very day. Do you think there's any I left out? Let me know in the comments. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe. And if you're interested in seeing more of my videos, including more historical top 10s, you should see some of them on your screen now. Thanks for watching.